So welcome, uh, colleagues, to the uh, this exciting event. We're announcing winners and progress of the challenge program for adaptation innovation that uh, we at the GF has been supporting under the Least Developed Countries Fund and the Climate Change. I'm sorry, Special Climate Change Fund. My name is Chizaoki. I'm the the lead environmental specialist for the GEF, and I also have the manage uh, the pleasure of managing the the two adaptation related funds for the the GEF. So um, it's a pleasure to welcome all of you to this event. I have to say that the. When we had the, uh, the same event in Madrid in 2019, also at the Japan GCF Pavilion, I swear to God, that was the event that created the most positive energy, as well as a, a lot of buzz and excitement. Um, and I think it's uh, thanks to the, the excitement of the winners, as well as the excitement of the great ideas for adaptation support that you partners today here, who will be announced very shortly, uh, are putting on the table. But uh, I also wanted to highlight that since it's been two years since we had our first call for proposals and winners announced, in addition to making the announcement for the second phase of the uh, challenge program, we have the uh, pleasure of actually hearing from uh, partners who were the who actually made the the, the first cadre of uh, first challenge program um, winners. So we have the great pleasure to also have um, our partners over here. And before we, announce, we go into the announcement of the, uh, the winners of the second call for proposals, we wanted to take a moment to hear from those uh, winners and how they're doing, what their perspectives are, as well as progress that's being made by the first round of winners. So, are we supposed to have the slides behind me? Okay, so without much ado, why don't we uh, start with um, the Landscape Resilience Fund managed by SASPOL in partnership with WWF. So then we will hear from Asian Development Bank about this very interesting and innovative insurance, na insuring of a natural asset in the Pacific. So first we go with Urs, Urs Dietrich. Uh, who is a managing director of the Landscape Resilience Fund for the South Pope Group, and also David McCauley, a very old friend of the GEF. Um, I don't mean to say you're old. You're a really <laughs> sorry. <laughs> David is a senior fellow with W. <laughs> I'm sorry, dear friend. English is not my first language. I'm sorry. <laughs> David McCauley is a senior fellow with WWF, who is a uh, one of the implementing agencies of the uh, GEF as well as the implementing agency for this project. So, uh, Urs, um, please, you have two to three minutes to share with the audience with us uh, the progress made and what you have been doing. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're very happy to, to be here after two years of uh, intense work and, prog and progress. And um, yeah, thank you to, to the Global Environment Facility for brokering this great relationship between the World Wildlife Fund and the World Wide Fund for Nature. We're working with both the US team for the Jeff project and with the German speaking team in Switzerland and Germany for the rest of the fund for brokering this relationship with South Pole in Switzerland and uh, founding the Landscape Resilience Fund, which is a Swiss venture philanthropy organization that provides finance to small businesses in developing countries that are situated in at risk landscapes and are already now suffering from the effects of climate change. And um, I think one of the major factors that really got us to really work together and grab this opportunity was the flexibility with which the Global Environment Facility designed the project. So this adaptation challenge program with a very quick concept note and then being open for everyone, bringing everyone to the table, not having high barriers to entry. Um, I think that's a great, great um, sign for how the public sector can be catalytic and bring in different companies and organizations to submit their ideas without too much of an upfront investment of time and energy without knowing how it's going to really end up. And for us, we then um, structured the Landscape Resilience Fund based on the idea that we need more integration integration of climate adaptation, mitigation, and biodiversity conservation, and of course other SDG benefits. And with this mindset of integrating everything, we thought we need to also 
address different needs of small businesses and landscapes, meaning we work in a landscape approach. We have a landscape window where we bring together stakeholders. We work in project preparation, which is what the Jeff finances, the investment readiness window, because there's really all these wonderful projects out there that you hear of all the time, but still the private sector and the investors, they don't see that because they say, look, they're not ready for investment. Where's the business case? Where is the documentation? Where's the financial model? And all of this, we try to develop and help them with in our investment readiness window. And lastly, we do the um, investment through soft loans, flexible loan agreements with SMEs, even if they have limited collateral or limited track record, truly get them into a position where they're attractive to the private sector. And we're very happy to announce that we're uh, almost ready to sign our first loan agreement with a wonderful small business. Happy to talk about this also one-on-one -on -one afterwards. And I'll hand over to David for now. Thank you. Thanks, Urs. I don't have a whole lot more to add on that, but I, I would just say uh, we are very uh, appreciative of the opportunity to to work together with uh, South Pole on this. You know, it's no surprise to me, Chiz, why this this event generates a lot of interest. If you think about what's being discussed here and what was being discussed in Madrid and before that uh, around this space, it's about increasing funding for climate change adaptation. That's where, we're, that's where we are. And within that, it's about generating and mobilizing private sector finance for adaptation. And then it's about um, generating increased deal flow, which is one of the key barriers, and working from small scale to bigger scale and scaling up, and then working with vulnerable communities and vulnerable countries. So this challenge program, though it's relatively small money, let's admit, uh, there's yet another opportunity is this leveraging. That's another part that everyone's talking about. So I guess it's not at all surprising to me that this is uh, attracting a lot of attention. As for WWF's role, we are very pleased in the last round to have been working with, with one of the partners that was selected and then to, uh, I don't look Asian, but as you know, I spent most of my life in Asia. And so uh, um, I'm used to arranged marriages in Asia, you know, this, uh, and they often work sometimes even better than love marriages. Not that we're not uh, mutually attracted. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, I think this, is, this, is gonna be a, this has been already proven to be a very good partnership with South Pole. And I have to put a shout out for Willis Towers Watson, our, our other partner under the previous round of the challenge. So uh, uh, that's also working equally well and moving forward quickly now to meet a very important need in the Pacific. That's all I have to say. It's a great program. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much for that. It's great to have a uh, um, uh, real feedback, real-time feedback on what's going on with the first winners, and also to hear perspective as to. Um, I would say, you know, when we started this challenge program, from our perspective, it, we thought it was more of an incremental innovation in the sense that usually we take proposals from agencies, right? But this was one of the few occasions we did an open call for proposal. Anybody could submit a, a, um, a three-page concept. And we just went from that to selecting a number of um, finalists. And some of them were uh, indeed submitted by GF agencies. Others completely new to us, but well known or have great potential to catalyze investments in uh, private, uh, from the private sector in adaptation. So we had a little bit of leap of faith from there to do arranged marriages, such as what you're seeing over here. And I'm um, seriously, uh, we're very um, pleased that that model seems to be working very well. And uh, we, we really want to see how far we could take this as we have the, uh, the, the next round of the, uh, the strategy that, that we're developing for the LDCF and SCCF. So without much ado, I, it's my pleasure to invite Noel O'Brien, uh, Principal Climate Change Specialist at the ADB. And uh, Noel, can you share a, a brief update on how the public-private partnership for Coral Reef Insurance Project is progressing? Uh, thank you, Chaz. And um, ADB, uh, the Asian Development Bank, we're very pleased to be here and to have been part of the first batch of recipients. So it's a partnership for coral reef finance and insurance in Asia and the Pacific. And the objective of the project is to enable large-scale finance to increase climate resilience of coastal businesses, communities, and livelihoods in selected countries of Asia and the Pacific. 
So I think for the group here today, uh, probably don't need to draw to, uh, to, to emphasize, but obviously healthy coral reefs uh, are a an, an, an very important part for providing food, generating income, and protection. Uh, reefs absorb up to 97% of wave energy. So in terms of uh, nature-based solutions and coastal adaptation, they play a critical role. Uh, ADB has um, taken the, uh, the model that was developed by the Nature Conservancy uh, for Quintana Roo in Mexico, and we've been working to uh, adapt this into the Asian context. Um, we've been working with stakeholders in Fiji, Indonesia, Philippines, and Solomons um, to better understand how uh, the approach uh, might be uh, adapt, ad uh, move for taken forward uh, to um, into a, a an instrument, uh, a commercial instrument. Uh, in these countries. Uh, we've got project areas um, within um, uh, the four countries. Um, we've been working with NGOs, the Nature Conservancy's Ocean Risk and Res Re Resilience Action Alliance. We've been working with private sector tour and travel operators, and then the insurance and the reinsurance companies who are interested in creating new markets. Um, so at, at the moment, uh, we have uh, potential sites in Fiji, potential site in Solomon, uh, Philippines, and Indonesia. And that process is still evolving, how exactly the modality will work. Uh, one important point is that uh, uh, coral reef insurance and is a new modality also within ADB. And so it's also been a learning process. Uh, we've had a number of webinars uh, to, to draw attention to the approach, but also to consider how the met methodology might be expanded to, um, uh, to other uh, coastal um, uh, protections such as mangroves, seagrasses, etc. We've been able to leverage additional financing, uh, first of all, from ADB's technical assistance, a support program to climate resilience investment pathways across the Pacific has, has been able to help with uh, developing baseline assessments and stakeholder engagement in Fiji and Solomons. Uh, there's a program in the Philippines. It's a $100 million loan to the government for sustainable tourism development on the island of Pal Palawan. This will focus on tourism zones, and the loan will complement the GEF funds through support for tourism infrastructure, integrated ecosystem uh, management planning, planning, sustainable financing of coral reef ecosystems and livelihoods. Um, also within ADB, we have a special program, the Asia Climate Pacific Climate Finance Fund, which is all focused on scaling up support to um, the insurance sector. And this will further support the coral reef damage models in the four countries, cost-benefit analysis for reef rehabilitation and restoration, data correlation, and providing countries with open source, multi-hazard data, base access to data. And, and then lastly, we have a private sector development initiative for Fiji and Solomon Islands, uh, which will now bring in further support to develop the instrument and to explore how uh, funds uh, can be raised from private sector, from tour operators, um, from uh, hotels on uh, a, a, a levy on per beds per night to actually start to cover the cost of the premium. Yeah, so we'll be also looking to scale it up in other countries, Vietnam, Cambodia, Vanuatu, Papua New Guinea, Palau have all expressed interest. Uh, we're in collaboration with WWF's Coral Reef Rescue. There's the 50 Reefs Initiative uh, from Bloomberg, uh, the Global Fund for Coral Reefs, uh, as well as the Coral Triangle Initiative. Uh, so also very big thank you to GEF for this collaboration, along with much of our other collaboration. So thanks, Jess. Thanks so much, Noel, for that uh, 
that very interesting uh, uh, description. You know, when we first started to look into this, we everybody talked about the Quintana Roo model and how we could actually replicate this in other places. And our our little support for this was literally sport, really small. But it's really encouraging to hear from you that ADB is actually taking this on board, and there's a lot of interest to really do something in other countries in the region uh, above and beyond what the, the challenge program can support. And it's also good to, to have the tie-in with nature-based solutions as well as innovation. So thank you so much for that. So now we will hear from um, my dear colleague. Um, I used that correctly this time. Uh, Jason Spensley. Hey, hey yeah. uh, just, just one quick thing before we go to Jason, if I may. First of all, Noel. Since your notes are wrong, you're, she's now the climate director at a ADB. Apologies. As of two, two, three days ago. So congratulations. Uh, right. yes. Well, my one of my successors, so I have to call her out. And second, if anyone's interested in learning more about the the resilience fund, we're going to have an event at the Panda Hub on Thursday at 2 p.m. So that we'll go in more depth. So if you're interested in this model with South Pole, sorry, I had to do a shout out on that. Thanks. Thank you so much for that. No, thank you. And uh, apologies for that and congratulations. Um, so now we go to my colleague, Jason Spensley, uh, who is actually managing the challenge program. And I'm sure many of you here have been in contact with Jason through the, the process of uh, selection as well as organizing this event. So Jason is going to provide an overview of how quite a number of uh, projects um, and concepts that came to us um, in the second round of a challenge program. And he's also going to highlight the selection process that we went through to get to the winners and the finalists that are here today. So uh, he's going to be joining remotely, and I hope technology will not let us down. Greetings. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, there you are. Great. Over Thank to you. you. It's a real pleasure to be with you, albeit uh, remotely. As Chiz has rightly said, we really received a wealth of submissions from a diversity of technology and, and private sector innovators, which to us confirms that the barrier to innovation and private sector action for adaptation is not a shortage of ideas and motivation. Uh, to be precise, 418 concepts were received from almost as many actors. And of these, 80 were prioritized based on the established criteria into a, into a short list. I and other colleagues had the pleasure to review all of them. And I really mean pleasure because they provide a sort of market analysis of current ideas and opportunities in the field of innovation and private sector action for adaptation. I'd like to share a very quick sense of this analysis now. Um, and if we could please go to slide number three, who supported project concepts. As you see indicated in the pie chart on the left side of the slide, many of the submitters were NGOs with either a subnational, national, or international focus. And many other submissions were directly from private sector actors such as commercial financial institutions, technology goods or service providers, and consulting firms. Still, others came from academia and importantly, national and subnational government actors. As indicated in the pie chart on the right hand side of the slide, just over half of the submissions were focused on Sub-Saharan Africa. South Asia accounted for 14% and 8% of the submissions were globally focused. Next slide, please. A slide four titled Innovation Strategies Proposed. Uh, we all appreciate that adaptation innovation comes in many forms. The greatest focus among the concepts was on making supply chains more resilient to the impacts of climate hazards. And the second most common focus was technology innovation and scale up through piloting and commercialization. Incubation and acceleration of micro, small and medium enterprises, perhaps to no surprise, was another key focus. Transforming lending practices for adaptation and resilience was uh, a further key focus among the submissions. And next slide, please, on climate hazards to be addressed. This is the last slide. Importantly, project concepts defined the specific climate hazards and their impacts uh, that aim to be, uh, that solutions aim to be provided for, to, for, for the benefit of local populations. Floods, droughts, 
changing precipitation patterns and temperature changes were all of common focus. As a final point, before we go back to Chiz and uh, begin to hear the exciting announcements, I'll briefly share how these concepts were reviewed and prioritized. All concepts submitted were carefully reviewed by a technical committee based on criteria defined in the call for concepts. Shortlisted concepts were further assessed for their differing strengths until a final set were defined that matched the funds available for this round of the program, of course, taking into consideration balancing factors among regions, types of innovation strategies and proponents. For the highest prioritized concepts not submitted by or with the Jeff agency, the Jeff Secretariat helped create a partnership with the Jeff agency for preparing, presenting, and if approved, implementing LDCF and SCCF project proposals through the normal Jeff project cycle. With that, uh, back to you, please, Jess. Thank you so much, Jason. And um, so, without much further ado, uh, we're going to switch scenes here and um, start introducing winning solutions to catalyze innovation and private sector action through the challenge program. Thank you. So now comes the exciting part. We will announce the winners because in this round there are 10 winners and 10 finalists. Um, I'm going to invite them up to the stage with their GF agency partners in three groups of three or four uh, finalists. Before we do, I'd like to attest to the strong quality of project concepts that we received. And now we're very much thrilled to announce the first set of three winners. Can you see them? Excellent. So I'm going to ask, um, it's my, actually my, I'm going to ask uh, the FAO as well as a representative from International Center for Tropical Agriculture and WBCSD as well as Windrock International to, um, if you're here, take the stage. If you're not here, virtually be there. So congratulations to the winners. So we're actually very delighted that FAO is going to be the agency for these three uh, very exciting projects. So I'm going to ask my friend, Zituni, to say a few words uh, to, to introduce the, the FAO's engagement in this. And I'd like to give maybe two to three minutes each to the, the finalists uh, here as well as, uh, I guess, virtually to, to basically introduce their concept and let us know uh, what you plan to do with this uh, challenge program. So over to you. Well, thanks very much, Chief, for this opportunity. It's really a pleasure to be here amongst everyone and to be part of this challenge program for um, adaptation innovations. Um, it is obviously very, very timely, very relevant to us um, because food is rising up the agenda for addressing the multiple challenges that we're facing, not just climate change, biodiversity loss and also the increase in hunger. And more importantly, also adaptation that is really receiving more attention now than before. I think we've been talking for so long about mitigation and it's great to see now that we need to talk across the board, mitigation, adaptation and building resilience. And obviously for um, food security, all are relevant to that because um, you know, food is an important part of um, the solution to, to the climate, climate cl crisis. And innovation is absolutely key in going forward and looking at the future uh, of agriculture and in tackling food security. And I talk about innovation in the wider uh, context, as you can see from, from, from the titles that were projected about the, the, the project. Innovation is not only about hard technology, but also about uh, the local knowledge, the experience of smallholder farmers that innovate all the time in adapting to changing conditions in relation to not just climate change, but other uh, challenges as well. So really the overall context of, of this is driving food and agriculture to be part of the solution to, to the climate uh, crisis. And 
We're really delighted to, to be selected as the Jeff Agency for uh, three projects and the, um, the Jeff Challenge Program for Adaptation Innovation. And, and these three projects, they really operate across the, the spectrum of innovation approaches and, and multi-sectoral partnerships and uh, for more climate resilient, sustainable uh, and innovative agri-food uh, systems. Um, so just to finish, um, you know, we're really looking forward to working with, with the partners, particularly the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, the Winrock International, uh, the Alliance of Biodiversity International uh, and SEAT to strengthen really the agri-food systems adaptation and resilience going forward. So it's a pleasure really to, to be here, to be part of this exciting program. And I'll hand over to them so you can hear from them, you know, th their experience on this. Thank you very much. Thank you, you Zaytuni. So why don't we go to Andy Jarvis? Yeah? Is that okay? So um, tell us about scaling financial and information service for small folder adaptation project. Okay, thanks. So a huge thanks, first of all, for this. Um, I mean, we all listen out there. It's We need new, bold, interesting, innovative solutions. And this is exactly the way. And I congratulate uh, GEF and the implementing agencies involved in this in, in spurring on that innovation process. So a big thanks to the... To, for creating this fund and, 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 and the way we're going about solving these things. So our project combines three really amazing things. First of all, the glitz of TV and media. The second is the brilliance of scientists and science. And then the third is the importance of farmers. And so we put those three things together and it really starts with the question, when will the rain start? And then out of that, there is a, a, a whole process whereby through TV, and we're going to have the Shamba Shape Up, which is like a TV soap opera kind of hands-on fix the farm program that goes across um, out in, uh, in Eastern and Southern Africa, accompany farmers through the process of innovating on their farms, uh, finding solutions to risk that they face from climate. And it'll be from the TV, so there'll be on, on, on we'll, there'll be programs, and you'll have the, the whole Eastern and Southern Africa able to see programs of how farmers are doing this. But there's also an app, a digital app, and through that digital app, we can have thousands of farmers participating, and they'll be receiving information of, well, when should you plant, and how should you plant, and what kinds of practices can, uh, uh, are gonna be best. And so it's bringing real-time information into this ecosystem so that farmers can be making the best decisions to build their resilience and, and take risks. And there's a really innovative component on there that's also looking at the credit side, so that it's not just saying, hey, you should do this, but also, hey, these are means of accessing credit as well, where the very practice that you're going to do is going to reduce the, the risk for that credit to come in and that finance to, to, to be enabled. So it's a wonderful partnership, and thanks so much for, for having the chance to, to showcase this. Thank you so much for that. You know, reading every single one of these concepts have been very exciting, but to hear directly from you, you know, it's very exciting and I'm, I'm just, I think that next time we have this meeting, we're gonna have a very difficult time selecting only few people to share us the, the experience, but you know, thank you for that. So now we go to Patricia McCall, Vice President, Corporate Affairs and Strategy of Windrock International to talk about Net Zero Adaptation Finance and ZAF. Great, thank you, and, and I echo the same remarks. Thank you so much for this opportunity to both um, GEF and FAO for, for having us. And um, you know, for us, this has really been an innovative proposal and process because we're taking activities and expertise across Winrock that um, we pull upon our different organizations. We, um, we're about, I don't know, two, 2,000 people, 1,200 to 2,000 people globally, NGO working across agriculture, climate, environment, but also have a very large human rights education and empowerment program. So we looked across the organization and really wanted to bring those tools. So our um, proposal and project is really about how do we bring together the work that we've been doing with the private sector on net zero strategies together with innovative financing and um, measurement. So we have 
have really three, I'm, I'm, I have a longer discussion, but I don't think I have that much time, so I'm gonna summarize it. Um, the strategy really is based on three core principles. So one is we have been doing um, extensive work with private sector organizations. You can see it on our website. The most recent one is Nestle doing their RFP for um, their scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions and looking across um, through their supply chain and trying to identify projects that meet their emissions. And through that, what we looked at doing in this um, project is really matching adaptation as a screen for those projects. So we have an existing tool called WinRes, which screens for resilience indicators. Through this project, we will uh, adapt, you know, adaption um, indicators into that tool so that when private sector companies are looking to um, meet their net zero objectives, we have a further screening tool that allows us to look at those processes and have better decisions. The second part of um, our strategy is really about um, innovative finance. So we do have a sustainable finance um, uh, section of, of Winrock, and we looked at what are some of the uh, key barriers for these projects that we're looking to use in, a, in our offsets and, and, and potentially the insets. And a big part of that is access to finance, as we all know, especially within adaptation. So we're putting together a bridge finance facility that will have three components. One is a bridge loan fund, one is a credit enhancement fund, and one is an interest rate buy-down fund. And really what it means is that we are um, using blended finance to take away some of the risk that allows the private sector to come in and and potentially finance this risk as well as multilaterals and other funds. And then the last piece I would um, add in that's strategic for us is that we also have the largest carbon market in the U.S. called the American Carbon Registry, um, which is part of Winrock. And through that, we are able to take our design and standards excellence that we do through ACR and really apply that when looking at these projects to make sure that they meet the highest integrity standards. So um, those are the three components and bringing them all together under one program to facilitate more finance um, and really linking the private sector with these projects is the idea of the NZAF program. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Patricia. And it's it's uh, we're also very excited to be not just working on these projects, but with our partnership with Winrock. So we're very much looking forward to this. So last but not least in the first batch, uh, we have the public-private blended finance facility for climate resilience rice landscapes. So we have Diane Holdorf, Managing Director from WBCSD. So Thank please. you so much and congratulations. It's so exciting to be here. I'm so pleased to be able to represent WBCSD and the partners with whom we participate in the Sustainable Rice Landscapes Initiative, particularly FAO. Thank you so much for that partnership. Sustainable Rice Platform, but equally also GIZ, Erie, and um, yeah, I think that actually captures the key partners there. UNEP, I think, has been in there as well. But this, you know, rice is actually one of these key crops that so many people depend on. Over one billion people in the world are dependent on rice. Three and a half billion people rely on it as their primary caloric intake each and every day. And about 60% of the people experiencing hunger globally live in rice-dependent geographies. At the same time, as we connect agriculture to the climate challenge, rice is one of the leading contributors from the agricultural food sector toward methane emissions, huge contributor to um, climate change. But rice farmers are at the forefront of the challenges placed by climate change as well. So what we've looked at is what are the ways that we can, through the Sustainable Rice Landscapes Initiative, start to take action through funding to change practices on the ground. And we're so excited to be a recipient here for the Resilient Rice Landscapes facility. As you said, it's a blended finance facility that's really going to catalyze both private and public sector investments so that we can scale up the adaptation on Adaptation Day at the COP, by the way. Great day to be doing this. Scaling up adaptation and resilience for rice farming and the farming practices. So the grant here from the Jeff is gonna be very instrumental, obviously, in setting up this new facility. We're expecting it to benefit a million people directly, delivering adaptation benefits for an area estimated at between two and three million hectares across Asia, one of the key regions, as you identified earlier. So, so pleased to be here and part of this today, and thanks so much for the opportunity. 
Thank you so much. Those numbers are very impressive, and we have been supporting quite a number of rice-related projects at the country level, and we also felt that there is a need to have that that bridge as well as connection among the, the national projects and making sure there is the uh, public-private blended finance opportunities that could be provided. So we're very much looking forward to this. So uh, one more round of applause to the FAO and the three winners. Thank you. So now we're going to move on to the second group. And the second group is um, implemented by IFAD, International Fund for Agricultural Development, um, who will be partnering as a GF agency. So now it is my pleasure to invite the representatives of IFAD, as well as BNP Paribas, Cropin, Grameen Credit Agricole Foundation. So please take the floor. And congratulations to you all. Okay, so um, we're delighted that Janie, Janie and you could be here. So why don't we start with you from the EFAP perspective, and perhaps you can say a few words uh, about um, your engagement in this, this um, cadre of uh, concepts related to agriculture and agricultural development, and uh, what your expectations as well as outlook might be. So. Thank you very much, Chiz. And uh, as the other said, it's really a pleasure for IFA to take part of this. And uh, thank you for, for matching us with these very innovative projects. Um, it, it, we're really looking forward to bring in more uh, innovative um, financing and approaches in our projects as, for adaptation as well as the private sector. So we're really keen to engage. And it matched very well with two main, um, let's say, approaches or models uh, that we're working on, on adaptation and agriculture. So one is through our uh, ASAP program, which is uh, adaptation of small older agriculture. And we have a new version now called ASAP Plus that uh, we hope that these projects will, will um, you know, that we could bring in uh, as well in, the, in IFAD investments and ASAP Plus uh, projects, these, these innovations. So we're really keen in, in, uh, in exploring them with, uh, with these projects. And our um, other approach is through inclusive green financing where we're working with public development banks and bringing, uh, you know, opening uh, green uh, credit lines for, for adaptation and mitigation. So we think these projects with the, um, the certificate of portfolio of nature-based solution, as well as the framework of indicators and the digital uh, ag stuff will be really, uh, will really uh, bring, like come in, that we, we are, we'll be able to scale this up. So that's why we were really interested in partnering and uh, again, we are uh, looking forward for uh, this collaboration and meeting each other and, and, and working together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janie. So without much further ado, I'm going to ask Sebastian Soleil, um, Head of Energy Transition and, Energy and Environment for BNP Paribas, to talk about the winning concept, which is, it's a long title, Certification of Nature-Based Solution Portfolios of Inclusive Financial Service Providers for Scaling Climate change, no, CC climate change adaptation of biodiversity financing for smallholder farms. So please. Thank you. So at first I would like to warm, warmly thank so the GF for supporting us, IFAD uh, to work with us, and uh, YAPU, um, the NGO that is uh, our partner in this project. So this project is based on four core principles. The first one is we know that it's not possible to fight efficiently climate change without preserving biodiversity at the same time. That's why nature-based solutions, among others, are very, very important. Second thing, um, it's very important to develop nature-based solutions at a very local level with local uh, communities, um, small farm holders, and these kind of things. Third principle, uh, to help these small farm smallholders, these local communities, uh, inclusive finance can be a very, very effective tool. And fourth principle, we talk a lot of, uh, about uh, impact finance, but as a financial institution, we know that it's very important 
uh, for us to be able to measure the impact of what we finance and to show to all our stakeholders that what we finance is effectively promoting climate change adaptation and biodiversity. So that's why with our partner Yapu, we have been working for quite some time on a methodology uh, to assess and to, to assess the portfolios of uh, inclusive finance service providers regarding uh, what they do in terms of climate change adaptation and uh, biodiversity. And so this project is to develop a certification scheme to assess the share of this uh, inclusive finance service providers uh, portfolio that is really financing climate change adaptation and uh, biodiversity resilience. And so uh, with this certification scheme, we will be able to assess the share of their portfolio and to assess to what extent what the finance uh, is really uh, financing climate change adaptation and uh, nature-based solutions. And so let's, uh, I hope that all together we'll be able to make this uh, project a, a true success. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Now we have two other finalists uh, who will be joining us remotely. So I hope it works. We have, we have uh, Kunal Prasad, co-founder and chief operation officer of CropIn. And he's going to introduce the winning concept called Smart Farm. Great. Um Thank you so much. Uh, uh, and we are really excited to be a part of this winning cohort uh, of the challenge program. Uh, so CropIn Smart Farm basically intends to implement a technology platform with innovative knowledge management system and partnerships to build and strengthen the resilience and adaptive capacity of the smallholder farmers towards the climate change. Uh, and effectively, it will have four important components. The first component would be about digitizing and streamlining the entire end-to-end -end process for the smallholder farmers, knowing where they are, what layer they're located, what crops they're growing and things around that. The second would be to bring in a very hyper-local uh, climate-based advisory services for this set of farmers, which means from the time of sowing, crop selection, to package of practices implementation, to mitigating the risk from any pests and disease, the entire program will help the farmers to mitigate and adapt towards the climate change in their own respective locations. The third component of the program is the, is the most innovative part where we'll have the risk and the actors in the agriculture value chain, which will be promoting the inter-engagement uh, of the credit and the market linkage facilitation. And this will basically help in terms of building the trust and the confidence based on data and evidence. And the fourth component would be about like you know, scaling the program from a, a small level to the large institutional capacity where governments and long-term asset creation could be, could be made and made it much more sustainably. Uh, so eventually the platform would be initially implemented with 200,000 farmers uh, where the model will be that you know, local resources extension workers of 2,000 members would be created with our partners and they would help in terms of strengthening the ground implementation, uh, translating the knowledge into helping the farmer trans transform into sustainable uh, practice adaptation and, and regenerative practices and thereby improving the resource use efficiency, soil health and the bio biodiversity altogether. So we're very happy to bring this entire technology platform with bringing the local expertise to help the transform, transform the agriculture and bring it, make it more climate resilient. Thank you so much for selecting us. Yeah, thank you so much. Some of you might know that Cropin has been very successful in India and we're very excited to, to, to play a small role to have this replicate in other parts of the countries, of other parts of the world, such as Africa. So this is, I think, is a very interesting case of South-South and private sector engagement. And we're very excited to see how this is going to go. So uh, the third um, winner of the, the second group is um, with Grammy Credit Agricole Foundation. We have Eric Campos, Managing Director of uh, Grammy Credit Agricole Foundation, joining us remotely to introduce the Indicators Framework for CCA and Biodiversity Conservation Finance for Smallholders. Yes, thank you very much no, to, to give me the, the opportunity to, to present the project. And, uh, and thank you very much to, to be supported by uh, IFAD and uh, Jeff um, Agency. Uh, the, the, the project that I uh, wanted to, to present I mean, the idea is to put the, the microfinance sector at the core of uh, the climate uh, adaptation for uh, rural communities. 
So Grameen Clinical Foundation provides debt financing and technical assistance uh, to financial service providers, uh, meaning the microfinance institutions, with a specific focus on rural communities and uh, small scale producer and agriculture. So we have been created in 2008. Uh, we work on 40 emerging countries and we work with 80 uh, partners, 80 financial service uh, providers. So with uh, Yapu, we have uh, um, work on a pilot, on a project pilot in Benin, and we have supported one MFI in Benin in the formalization of uh, its environmental strategy and in the implementation of an experimental farm to finance smallholders and train them on more sustainable agri-practices and the inclusion of climate risk assessment indicators into the loan assessment. And uh, the objective is, is to scale up, moving from one pilot to four uh, new countries and four new um, FSPs. So, uh, as you know, for private and public finance for climate change adaptation, it's very difficult to reach the, the, the small scale producer and rural communities. And the idea is to, to use the FSPs, the smallest one, in order to reach the, the end beneficiaries and to, to, to reach the small scale producer. So the idea is to, to, to work with a pilot of set of indicators and a framework for uh, implementing uh, in, the, in, the, in the work in the loan assessment and to implement such a framework and indicators as well as specific products will allow the public and private sector to coordinate their methodology and activities and propose a concrete offer to the FSPs that is uh, now one of the, of the main challenge because you know that the private sector is missing key information to be able to channel the money for climate change adaptation as well as to engage with the public sector to leverage public finance for, uh, for adaptation. So the, the objective of the, of the project is first to establish a blended finance vehicle with the mandate and capacity to finance and provide technical assistance and technology support to FSPs. Second, to pilot such a scheme with four institutions and diffuse the lesson learned. And then of course, to engage and, uh, the further private and public sector actors to use such a vehicles, indicators and, and framework in order to support and to better support the FSPs to finance climate change adaptation and be able to, to meet and to reach the local communities' needs. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, thank you so much, uh, Janie and um, uh, Sebastian, for being here. And thank you so much for uh, the two additional finalists joining from remotely. So. We're gonna move on to the third group. Um, so let us let us give them a, a, another round of applause. We go to group three. And it's going to be UNIDO, partnering as a GF agency. Um, and we also have Conservation International partnering with uh, one more uh, project. So it's my pleasure to invite the representative of BFA Global Earth Security, World Resources Institutions uh, Institute, System Resilience Forum, as well as Willis Towers Watson, and UNIDO. And I'm also going to be asking Heifer International Foundation, who is partnering with the, uh, Conservation International, to join all of us on stage. Nice to see you. So, we're going to start with uh, our UNIDO partner. Thank you so much, Tarek, for being here. Uh, Tarek M. Tarek is the uh, director of the, the Department of Energy of UNIDO. And you're going to be the agency for some of these exciting initiatives. And we'd like to hear from you, from your uh, expectations as well as perspective on why, um, why uh, you have been, um, I guess, match made, I guess, with the, some of these uh, interesting uh, proposals and what uh, UNIDO seeks to um, build on this experience. Do you hear me? Yeah. Thank you, Shez. And indeed, we are um, very much excited and honored, actually, to be matched 
uh, uh, matchmate with um, the three uh, project winners under the uh, Adaptation Innovation Challenge. Um, and we are very excited, um, and we're excited even more because you, 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 you probably know Shez, uh, supporting innovation and uh, innovation ecosystem is, is wired in UNIDO's uh, DNA and mandate because of, of the work we do under SDG 7.9, promoting innovation, infrastructure, and industry development. Um, I think uh, the exciting part of this is that um, we have been hearing it quite extensively in the last um, five, six days. The, the concentration of discussion on adaptation is, is the financing gap um, to, to address the challenge of adaptation, particularly in, in developing, at least developing countries. And, and of course, we, we have heard it also previously on, on so many occasions that we have to work with the private sector and we have to mobilize also private sector innovation and financing to, to, to work and address the uh, um, innovation, um, uh, the, the adaptation challenge. Um, so the three uh, um, innovative concepts from uh, BFA Global, uh, Earth Security, and uh, the World Resource Institute um, actually bring out of the box um, um, thinking and um, much needed experimentation for advancing new models of engaging and working with the private sector. And from that perspective, uh, we are excited as you need to, to work with the three partners um, to uh, demonstrate success and to work uh, with them on, on these experimentations. Um, we are also uh, looking forward to leverage uh, from the UNIDO's part uh, our extensive history working around uh, the uh, innovation program, particularly the partnership we have had with the Jeff on the clean tech innovation acceleration uh, uh, over implemented over 15 countries. So uh, and to bring also the experience of uh, mobilizing a private uh, private sector investment facilitation to uh, developers in the uh, adaptation projects. So with that, we are looking forward to working with the three partners, and uh, it's going to be an exciting journey. And uh, congratulations to all of uh, the winners in this uh, challenge. Thank you so much, Tarek. So why don't we now go to David Delser, Chair and, Ch Chair and Chief Information Officer of BFA Global to introduce the winning concept of acceleration of fintech-enabled climate resilient solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much, GF, for, for the support. And thank you, UNIDO, for bearing with us. Uh, I'm, I'm from Spain. In, in Spanish, UNIDO means united together. So I guess this was meant to be yeah. all, all along. Um, I just wanted to briefly mention where we come from uh, into the adaptation conversation. We've been working on, on innovation with fintech startups and, and larger incumbents from a financial perspective, a financial inclusion perspective for many years. Uh, and a couple of years ago, we started wondering what could we do with these phenomenal tools that are doing exponential inclusion like mobile money or, or you know, smartphone-based uh, financial services. What could we do for climate adaptation and resilience? And when we researched the landscape, what we learned quickly is that we do see a number of adaptation tools, but they're not really scaling very quickly, partially because they're not made affordable or accessible the way finance could. Um, and the second thing we learned is that it was hard to find uh, innovators, companies working in that intersection of adaptation and fintech, say. It was really hard. And it didn't make a lot of sense to us. And we concluded that, there's, that we're missing a, an ecosystem for innovation that supports those pioneers that want to trailblaze this field. And that it is a field that needs to happen. We need to lay a bridge between these two worlds of, of financial inclusion and, and climate action. And, it's phenomenal that the GF is stepping in, funding some of this initial experimentation to see all of us partners. I think pretty much everybody would fit that category. Um, what we wanted to do is, is launch this ecosystem and we form a task force um, with a number of players like PayPal, Ber Better Than Cash Alliance, the World Bank, SIGAP, um, the World Resources Institute as well, and the Race to Resilience from the UN. 
and we consulted with 50 different organizations just to gather their wisdom, their experience on, on how were past ecosystems, microfinance, inclusive fintech, pay go solar, how did they happen? And to just learn from the past, adapt for the future, and launch this ecosystem. Uh, we are calling the ecosystem uh, digital finance for climate resilience. And um, we, what we want to do in the next um, 10 years, I guess, or eight years, because there's only eight years left until 2030, is to get to 1 billion people using these types of tools and catalyze $25 billion per year going into this space. They're big numbers. Let's see where we end up. But in the shorter term, what we want to do is continue the ecosystem conversation because we need a lot of learning, cross-learning to happen. And we'd like to launch, to accelerate 100 startups using the methodology we've been already deploying for years. Uh, but because it's hard to find those startups, we also like to launch 100 new startups. Um, so if anybody is excited by that vision, please visit our website, df4cr.org, and, and get in touch. And again, thank you so much for, for giving us such a push. Thank you. I really enjoyed hearing those uh, indicators as well as your vision. And I'm um, looking forward to see how this is going to go. And um, uh, we have... We're very much excited about this concept. So now we're re joined remotely by Alejandro Litvoski, founder and CEO of Earth Security, um, who's going to introduce the uh, winning concept called a nature-based private investment facility for climate resilience in coastal, least developing country cities. Thank you, Jason. Uh, can you hear me all well? Very well. Hello. Uh, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be uh, with you today. And at least virtually, and I'm really delighted to be amongst the winners of the award. First of all, congratulations to all the winners, uh, also to Jeff for pulling together such an innovative group of uh, organizations. Very much looking forward to working with UNIDO on this. Um, and so much about what we need to do, I feel, is to help redesign financial flows based on the mutual recognition of companies, countries, and communities as being, I'd say, quite literally in the same boat. Um, we see an opportunity for, for companies to finance coastal adaptation in LDCs as they themselves grapple with the vulnerability of their value chains in these countries in a range of industry sectors. And they are seeing the need to report to their own investors on how they're addressing their climate risks. Now, we know that private sector investment into LDCs is a challenge, um, but climate change is not waiting. Uh, and we need to innovate in how we mobilize private sector finance to LDCs in new ways. So the, the project that we've designed is based on nature-based solutions, coastal ecosystems, not, not only because they're the most cost-effective adaptation measure, as we know, but also because they offer so much more value for money to companies in terms of return on investment. Now, we've worked um, last year in Pakistan and showed uh, how an infrastructure company that was planting mangroves uh, provided uh, uh, 20 times the return on investment of that conservation investment from a corporate due to the natural protection that these green infrastructures would provide in terms of their coastal assets, but also the increased value that it was providing to the incomes of local communities. So when we look at a range of LDCs, which are rich in coastal ecosystems, and our host countries to the value chains of a range of sectors from natural resources to manufacturing, it is so important to begin to connect these dots. And what we aim to do is to develop corporate commitments to the resilience of these regions. Uh, so rather than, you know, building gray seawalls, which are costly and actually quite carbon intensive, we want companies to help build green walls that help um, also create benefits for local communities that range, as we know, uh, from biodiversity to, to local incomes, from thriving fisheries. Now, climate change is creating a more insecure world and, you know, most likely a world that is more fragmented, that is more divided and with more conflict. And this is why this is also not very good for a stable business environment. So, you know, in our view, building climate resilience for companies also needs to deliver thriving societies and more resilient development that is working in balance with nature. So therefore, you know, just to finish, 
you know, I feel it's so necessary to create win-win mechanisms that will increase this mutual recognition between the adaptation needs of companies with those of local communities. And nature, in a way, has such a powerful role to play in this as we face the challenge of climate adaptation in the years to come. So really very much looking forward to this uh, project, working together with UNIDA, working under the umbrella of Jeff's support, and, and also co-evolving together with this amazing ecosystem of innovators that you've brought together. So thank you very much. Delighted, and uh, the rest is uh, all to come. Thank you so much. Now we move on to our third uh, winner from this group. It's a Coalition for Climate Resilience Investment, CCRI. And uh, that is a partnership of um, World Resources Institute. And I think today we have here um, uh, the uh, CEO of Willis Towers Watson, uh, John, Healy, John Haley, I'm sorry, as well as Alan Smith, who is the chair of the System, Systemic Resilience Forum of CCCI, Rebecca Carter, acting director of climate resilience for WRI. So uh, this is the, uh, the concept of Coalition for Climate Resilience Investment. Um, thanks very much, and uh, a sincere thanks to the uh, GEF for uh, this important award. Um, there, there's really only a handful of uh, organizations in the world with the reputation and the importance of uh, the GEF, and so we, we thank you for that. It's especially important to us, and we actually think it's going to enable us to accelerate our progress at a critical time. So the basic thesis of the um, Coalition for Climate Resilient Investment is that uh, resilient in we're, we're not building enough resilient infrastructure in the world. And you know, you look at something like the, Puerto, uh, the hurricane wiping out 75% of Puerto Rico, and it tells you that we, we can and we must do uh, better than that. And one of the things we thought is that the reason that doesn't happen is that, in fact, resilient infrastructure is often penalized because it's looked at it, the, the cost of building something in a more resilient way are obvious, but the benefits of having that resilient infrastructure are not so obvious. And so what we wanted to do was put together a coalition of groups, mostly led by the private sector, but importantly including some um, uh, uh, some public sector actors, but we wanted to get together a group that could put together standards for resilient infrastructure and could make sure we um, you know, were influential in having that built. And so what we did is we have a group that includes um, engineering firms, it includes construction companies, et cetera, where we were able to develop what the right kind of standards are for resilient infrastructure. We have a group of investors, and the group of investors we have now uh, is, uh, we have over $20 trillion um, under uh, advisement by those firms. And so if they are signing up to these kind of standards, again, that will make a big difference in uh, the way infrastructure gets done. And then we have uh, the rating agencies. S&P and Moody's have joined us, and if we can get them to sign on to uh, how these projects are evaluated and how risks are assigned to them, then again, that will make a big difference in that. Um, so we started two years ago um, at the uh, UN Climate Week, uh, September 2019, and uh, we, we now grown to where we have more than uh, uh, over 100 institutions that are part of this. And we've delivered two things uh, that we've announced at this COP. Uh, one of them is a, a national investment prioritization tool, and we've developed that with the government of Jamaica. And so what we've done is we've uh, looked at uh, uh, we, we've started out with water, energy, and transport, but we've uh, tried to understand what are the important uh, characteristics of resilient infrastructure and how Jamaica should understand how to prioritize them for climate resilience. Um, and with that, we've had uh, we've had the support, support, of course, of the uh, uh, government of Jamaica, but also the UK government, the Green Climate Fund, and a team from the University of Oxford that led a lot of the uh, uh, technical analysis there. We've also 
introduced uh, our physical climate risk assessment methodology. And this is the kind of uh, methodology that can be used for the asset design and structuring part of our work to make sure that that is, uh, is appropriate. We're now getting ready. We're going to be building on those. We're going to be rolling out the National Investment Prioritization Tool to several other countries during the course of the next year. We're going to uh, expand some of the work done on the uh, physical climate risk model. But we're also moving into our uh, capital formation model. And we've been working not just with governments, but with multilateral de uh, uh, development uh, agencies, because one of the things we want to make sure is the most vulnerable countries don't get priced out as we develop develop uh, this risk some more. But as we move into this capital phase, we've, uh, we're working on getting commitments for uh, resilient infrastructure. We um, are going to be, I think, announcing some very early in um, 2022. And by COP 2027, we hope to have at least $5 billion committed to that. So again, um, Thanks very much to the Jeff. We had, um, as, as you mentioned, uh, I had two of my partners here. In fact, some of my most unwavering partners, uh, Rebecca Carter uh, from the World Resources Institute and uh, Alan Smith from HSBC, who personally led the Systemic Resilience Forum. Um, just terrific partners. I think they had to run out to something else, but I did want to just thank them very much for um, all of their help and their support. And again, thanks very much to the GEF. Thank you so much for that. And we're very much looking forward to partner with you and see how we could roll this out on a pilot basis and some of the, as you said, the countries that could be priced out of here. You know, it, it's, it's really important for us that, uh, that we can uh, provide this kind of opportunities for the, the LDCs as well as the developing countries where the adaptation needs are the greatest. So thank you for um, being here and um, being part of this initiative. Last but not least, we're going to go to Hayford International, partner with the Conservation International as a GF agency. We have Oscar Castaneda, who is a senior vice president of Hayford International. And you're going to tell us about building climate resilience in supply chain for mobilization of adaptation funding. Oscar. This is a big task. And um, I appreciate very much the opportunity to be the last of the 10. There is a reason that we are the last, and I think that is important for me to congratulate every one of you, representatives of the different organizations, for being the winners. We are in a moment that we are going to make a transition from competing against each other to collaborating with one another. And this is an important transition, and there is another element that I would like to bring to the conversation today, is the importance of farmers. We can even write a book that can be called Farmers First and Last, oh, or perhaps was already done and written here in the UK. Farmers First and Last. And why are we considering the importance of talking about farmers, especially smallholder farmers? The main reason being they have a main purpose with two different components. They're responsible to feed humanity and at the same time, responsible to cool the planet. And for us, the importance of collaborating with them in order to affect two different things, the increased vulnerability and the reduction of resilience that smallholder farming systems all around the world already has. And to come with that idea, we have built a platform of collaboration Collaboration first with this thousand of smallholder farmer organizations that are waiting for the opportunity to collaborate. Number one. Number two is the collaboration with governmental entities. Ministries of Agriculture in Guatemala, Ministries of Agriculture in Honduras that are willing to engage in with the public sector. And to that, thank you very much for that partnership. And also the private sector. The private sector that is interested in spending and investing in adaptation strategies, but are looking for the answer where to invest and what is the uh, is ROI that they can get back of this investment. And in order to get to that, the other partnership that we are putting together is one with Conservation International and one uh, with the JF right now with this grant to develop an adaptation equivalency index. 
This is going to be a framework and a set of tools that will allow investors to recognize where they can invest best so that they can get the better result of investment for their contribution. And the result is going to be measured in that what everybody has been talking about today, the social and environmental impact that is going to be created by recognizing the different adaptation strategies that smallholder farmers in different value chains are already developed and implemented. In our case, we are going to be working in Guatemala and Honduras to begin with, with this initial grant in value chains that are important for us, coffee, so that we can stay awake while we dream of a better world, cocoa, so that we can en enjoy the afternoons also with an, with an imp there, there, there is this saying that we need to make sure that cocoa will remain because there is the only planet that has it. And spices in Guatemala, black um, old spice, cardamom, cinnamon, etc., etc., and working with over 2,000 farmers in those places to establish the system, an adaptation equivalency index that has an important promise. It's not only for heifer to use it. The reason that you told me that we were going to be the last is that we hope to be the first that can offer this tool to each of you, each one of you, so that we can have an agreement where to invest, what the return is going to be, and then we can put all our funds together. We are going to visit the Panda uh, uh, investment system, et cetera, because that is the place equally to uh, the, everything that we have heard, the amount of resources that are available. We are going to offer this platform so that we can use as a way to measure where to invest, what the result is going to be, and then keep on building this partnership with, I said farmers first, but I would like to say farmers last. And with that, I appreciate very much the fantastic opportunity to collaborate with uh, Jeff and with other entities to make this commitment today in moving into collaboration a reality of the work that we are going to do in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. So colleagues, so those were, we are the last, with the last batch, we have introduced the 10 winners of the second call for proposals for the challenge program for adaptation innovation. I'd like to offer the final round of applause to the winners before we move on to the next segment. Now I'm going to ask um, two global thought leaders to take the, take the podium, uh, Jay Co and Jorge Gastelmundi. Please join us on the stage. We're very fortunate and very lucky today to have two global thought leaders in the field of innovation and private sector engagement on adaptation who have been listening very intently to the winners as well as agencies and this great ideas as well as great concept that we're gonna be rolling out together. So. Um, they will share their insights and reflections of what they heard so far and, and perhaps give us some um, insights as well as suggestions on the way forward. To move. Okay, so can we start with um, Jorge first? Um, as uh, many of you may know, Jorge is the co-chair of the High Level Climate Action Champions Race to Resilience team. So please, Jorge. Chisuru, thank you for the invitation. Thanks for the GF for this uh, opportunity to speak. Uh, let me give you just a short introduction of the Race to Resilience. This is a campaign launched by the UN Climate Champions with the aim of disrupting the uh, resilience community. We have a long way to go, and uh, we wanted to put a challenge to the whole resilience community on how we better measure our impact. And uh, so for doing that, uh, we set out a spiritual goal of reaching, uh, increasing the resilience of four billion people by 2030. And to do that, we've set out a metrics framework and also a set of resilience transformations to uh, mobilize systemic change around uh, reaching that goal of four billion people. Those four billion people are not just a metric, it's not a number, it's actually four billion stories of people. And uh, the focus of the campaign is basically on the most vulnerable groups and communities around the world. And so, you know what? Uh, one group of vulnerable groups and communities that I haven't heard, unfortunately, today uh, in this conversation, both on the panels, 
Um, and also on the concept notes that I had a abstracts off and in a conversation of presentations is women. And uh, that's very unfortunate. Uh, I think that uh, the last speakers out of the, out of the last uh, seven or eight speakers all have been men. Uh, and that is unacceptable. It's not a, it's not a box to check anymore. Uh, women uh, are, represent 50 per, almost 50% of the agricultural labor force. And so for uh, uh, proposals that are, are focused basically on farmers and agriculture, not talking about women, uh, it's, it's unacceptable. Uh, women, as you know, are way more, women and children are way more affected than men by climate change. Uh, and they, we need women working in finance and microfinance. We need them. Not because uh, it's a nice thing to have, but uh, without social resilience, without social justice, it's impossible to have climate resilience and climate justice. Impossible. So uh, uh, one reflection I wanted to have is, you know, how these initiatives and this um, uh, approach that you've presented, I'm sure that you're including women on it. But the fact that it's not capturing the abstracts or in the presentations today is a big gap. Uh, women, as you know, uh, they are the, the rates of return of the repayment loans uh, in microfinance are higher uh, by women when women manage those. Women uh, uh, in microfinance, they use the proceeds of those uh, returns uh, into their homes, households. Uh, in women, when working micro enterprises, they look for the returns of those uh, proceeds to go into education, particularly focus on their daughters, particularly focus on girl childs. Uh, and um, you know, women are uh, at the forefront of, of, of the climate resilience. Without building that capacity, it's going to be really hard uh, to make it happen. Um, one reflection I wanted to have on, 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 on the proposals, I think that the majority of them, if not all of them, are deeply looking into developing the social resilience of the communities with whom they're working. And uh, that is uh, a very important thing to highlight, uh, very welcoming. Uh, and uh, at the end of the day, you know, the political processes that happen across cities, across governments, uh, hopefully will pick up on resilience. Uh, hopefully the, the, the governments in, that are taking turns over and over will uh, create sustainable uh, policies and programs that are sustained around, uh, across time. But in the meantime, while, we, while that hopefully happens, we need to strengthen the capacity of communities, both private, local private sector and uh, uh, community-led initiatives to stay there because they're, that, they're going nowhere. They're being there, they're leaving that city, they're leaving that, uh, that space. And so the fact that we can anchor uh, financial solutions at that level and make sure that those are sticking is critical. And so very welcoming to see that happening with these proposals. I'll just close with uh, saying that, you know, I'm extremely excited to see several of Race to Resilience partners, BFA Global, CCRI, um, Yapu as, as a member of one of our partners, there are race resilience partners. So uh, there is a lot of overlap. And uh, this uh, just serves as an invitation, open invitation to all of you uh, to look into the race resilience as a potential partner, becoming a partner of the campaign, and uh, helping us reach the 4 billion people uh, target that we have by 2030, which is not about a metric again, it's about stories. We want to build 4 billion stories and there are applicable, able, uh, available to everybody to learn about. So thank you so much for the time. Thank you, Jorge, and thanks so much for raising the, the gender angle. And rest assured, when these uh, projects are being developed, we will apply Jeff's very vigorous gender mainstreaming as well as gender um, policies. And maybe you missed the first panel, Actually, I was excited during the first panel, uh, women outnumbered men. So there is, I think, uh, good progress being made. But I do take your point that in these, any of these interventions, we need to make sure women and um, girls are part of the, the, the solution as well as part of the, um, I would say, uh, implementing partners. So thank you for raising that good point. So we're going to go to Jayco. Um, 
I'm sure you all know him. He's managing director of the Lightsmith Group, and as well as chair of the Global Resilience and Adaptation Working Group. And he's also an extremely successful innovator, as well as a longtime champion for adaptation and private sector engagement. So Jay, please. Thank you very much, and it's great to be here in the Jeff GCF Pavilion. Uh, Jeff has been a fantastic partner, and I, I would absolutely say as a, a partner of the Jeff, in terms of uh, the gender inclusion and equity inclusion components of it, we absolutely have learned a tremendous amount from them and other partners in terms of focusing our efforts and making sure that's not left behind. Um, I wanted first and foremost just to congratulate the Jeff on creating the Oscars for adaptation, <laughs> investment, and innovation here because we have 10 stars that are out there. And when I thought about trying to reflect on what these stars look like uh, and what connects the dots between them, what I can see is the creation of an increasing amount of constellations. If you start to connect the dots between these different types of approaches, there's very few times and you heard John Haley from Willis Towers Watson and smallholder farmers microfinance in the same sentence. And it's a wonder that this organization is able to connect the dots there and bring in both large scale capital, institutional capital at that scale, but also a real focus on, on women, on smallholders, on vulnerable populations together in the same conversation. It's by connecting those dots together that we can have a systemic and transformational effect. So I congratulate the Jeff on beginning to actually map that set of celestial bodies and connecting them into shapes and, and patterns that we can see. The patterns that I saw today um, look like the following. The first is, in terms of interventions, um, a few common themes really flow through them. Finance, finance among, uh, among them as input, so information finance going into systems and out of them uh, certification, measurement, output, and most importantly, the removal of vulnerability from particularly vulnerable populations that are increasingly going to be challenged going forward. And the second thing is thematically, it's great to see some common areas of approaches. You can see how these different stars connect in similar patterns. Farming and agriculture, of course, and then more detailed focus on rice. Um, coastal regions and supply chains over and over and over again. I'm extremely glad someone is working on preserving cocoa and coffee for me because I'm very, very concerned about that going <laughs> forward. And so is, so is my five-year-old daughter, Athena, who's very, not the cocoa, not the coffee part, but certainly the cocoa part of it. My wife's more concerned about wine going forward into the universe at large. <laughs> But also, new players in this set of constellations. How, you know, supply chains, providence, agriculture, but also heavy infrastructure or the future of infrastructure, making that infrastructure natural. Right? We heard mangroves uh, at the same time as talking about bridges, roads, water, power, telecom. These all need to be the future that we knit together in these patterns that we're going to see in the sky and to bring together financial technology and to mash that up with smallholder farmers and to add infrastructure and to add natural capital. These are the ways that we can actually really move forward. The third point that I really wanted to make here in terms of thematics and where I think that there's a an absolutely unique role that the Jeff can play is it's wonderful to see the first integrations that I have um, witnessed of biodiversity as being a serious concern and a serious objective of these products. And I would commend any of the stars that are out there that in your next uh, Oscar role, you add supporting actors or, or co-leads or, 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 or co in the biodiversity component. If we can actually take robust measurements from that, from this learning and apply them into large scale transitions, we have a chance to integrate that throughout everything. I have three quick suggestions that come out of this as a reaction. The first is this. A lot of these interventions rhyme. Microfinance, inclusive capital, lending, insurance, data, analytics. Can't we begin to aggregate? Can't we begin to knit these things together so that we don't replicate over and over again the same inclusive business models? Can we have lessons learned so that there's plugins or ways to then quickly access institutional capital? And that's one of the focus uh, areas, I think, that we're trying to connect the dots between GFANs or large scale capital and the interventions we're having here at the innovative uh, beginning parts of this. And the second point is to, to really echo Jorge's point to make sure that. In all of the transition we're talking about, the most vulnerable need to be an absolutely included component of it, especially on a gendered basis and especially in disadvantaged and, and indigenous populations that are out there. And there's a huge area where the Jeff has tremendous expertise. So the instruments that the Jeff has may be very different than institutional investors. And by knitting the two together, you can actually start to reach multiple layers of that transition and make that a systemic transition and not one where the rich go first and the poor hope to try someday to get behind it and, and be dragged along with it. So things like the technical 
technical assistance facility that we have in the craft strategy, uh, where the U.S. government and NDF have come alongside to kind of focus interventions and application of technology on a grant basis to low-income countries, to SIDS. That's an example of that. While the commercial strategy scales and tries to prove out the technology for adaptation and climate resilience in the craft strategy, which was helped to be launched by the Jeff and NDF, uh, really kind of proves out the investment case. The final thing I would say um, is this. I have to commend the Jeff because the Jeff's systemic approach to this uh, includes not just a blending of finance in a capital stack or in a set of solutions where you have different layers of risk, people taking first loss, people taking grant interventions. There's also really an innovation in blending over time. So the graduates that you saw from two years ago are now scaled up. And the graduates from this group of cohort of activities will continue to scale up. And we're going to need multiple generations over the transition that we're going to see. So by adding small amounts of funding, I mean, Kraft's uh, funding from the Jeff was announced in 2017 here at the COP. And now we've scaled up and tried to mobilize the first real capital for private sector adaptation and investment. I would commend those folks that actually create the instrument of the Jeff and suggest more flexibility for that, more ability to pilot, more ability to innovate, more ability to bring together this constellation of activities because you'll see different players, those different stars, that if we can connect the dots between them, the picture is going to be bigger than any single one of those points of light. So I think it's a wonderful experience here. I can understand why people are excited about being at this event. And so I congratulate the Jeff and all 10 winners for being among the, shine, the, the brightest stars in what needs to be a quite dark evening that we, get, we light up and actually connect the dots in. So thank you. Thank you, Jay, for those um, very insightful comments, as well as some uh, good suggestions to us to move forward in terms of creating that ecosystem among the winners also. And Jorge, thank you again for being here and giving us your insights as well as suggestions to us. Now we're coming to the conclusion of what has been a very stimulating, exciting, and Oscar-worthy event, I would say. And I believe <laughs> a very hopeful event. And now it's my honor and privilege to ask my boss, Carlos Manuel Rodriguez, Jeff, CEO and chairperson, to share his closing remarks. Well, thank you, Chiz. And uh, definitely, uh, Jay, we're competing here with the Royal Foundation that you know a few weeks ago gave the Airshot uh, Awards. Here we are with these uh, Oscar Adaptation <laughs> Awards. And uh, really delighted to be here. And you touch a nerve when you say coffee. I'm a four-generation coffee grower. And I had to learn the hard way. Thank you very much for yes, I had to. I, ha I had to learn the hard word, hard, hard way, how to deal with climate change in our coffee farm, which was inherited from my great grandfather, who had the beautiful idea to cut all the shade of the coffee 45 years ago, because that way he will go from 1,000 plants of coffee to 1,500 plants, and then when we inherit the farm. We were really struggling with you know, the impacts of climate change, drought, productivity down to the ground. And I told my cousins, because we run uh, as a family business, where I told my cousins, we need to take out 500 plants of coffee in plant trees. And they almost killed me when I said that. Since we did that, the humidity and temperature in the plantation uh, went down. More birds are in the plantation, less insects, less chemicals, and everything changed dramatically. And, and the government is paying us for the carbon. Those trees are f upside in and the, and, and, the, and the coffee plant. So it's a win-win situation, what, what I learned. But what I learned is that you know, adaptation may be, the adaptation effort may be at the, at the very end of what we do in the big climate ag uh, agenda. We always think about mitigation. We always think about a bright scientist or somebody in a lab doing something to offset those emissions. We always look towards MIT and NOAA and NASA and, and, climate, um, and climate mitigation. And adaptation is always at the very end of what we look, what we do, and what we think. It is because it happens in the less developed nations. And uh, this is a fabulous, fabulous way by which we can prove ourselves that we can bring the knowledge, the innovation, uh, in, the, in the most needed places of, of the planet, where people are really suffering. Because those who are there in a the lab in the north creating a solution uh, doesn't, does not necessarily know what the people in in less developed countries, small island states are, are going through. And it's not just a matter of building a bigger wall. 
or more gray infrastructure. It's understanding and connecting. Uh, and having uh, all of these people uh, assisting us, uh, uh, supporting countries who are really struggling, it, it is a pleasure. It is, it, it is so stimulus to, 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 to me and to many others that uh, have committed our life uh, for conservation, for sustainability. We can bring the new innovative approaches. When I read, I didn't read the 400 submissions, but I saw the list of them, and let me tell you, I wanted to give a reward to each one of those who participated, not just the ones who participated directly with the great ideas, but also the Jeff agencies that were there in the front line helping and supporting that. This is extremely encouraging. We are rewarding now 10 projects, 10 agencies, 10 initiatives in a, in a COP that will, um, will define a, 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 a before and after. This is the COP that will begin really leveling our attention to climate adaptation and to those who really need the adaptation. Today, to, uh, through this event, to this initiative, we are contributing big time in this effort to level up uh, the need to invest heavily in adaptation and understand the cost-effective ways by which we can do it. The private sector has a lot of, of capacities to help us. Uh, the, the way we can use nature is extremely important. And an area of high importance to me is the fact that we may be there in the front line with those countries dealing with climate adaptation that is not just a northern solution what will solve their problem. It is a domestic solution. When countries understand that they need to align their, their investment, public and private investment, with the climate adaptation strategy and with the Paris Agreement. So I, I want to thank you all for this. Uh, I look forward to uh, work very close uh, to this, uh, through these uh, projects and initiatives. I look forward to have working sessions uh, to see the outcomes and how do we amplify and mainstream and what we do in LDCF and SECF as our board will be extremely, extremely happy uh, to see us really bringing these new innovative approaches in the way we design and implement projects with these countries. So thank you so much.